Welcome to another moment in the Word. Paul wrote to Timothy in his final letter that he wrote to anyone in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. How do you respond when people, the Word, rebukes you? How do you respond when you're exhorted to do something that uh, is right, but you're not doing it? How do you respond? The passage we're looking at actually addresses that very question. We're looking at uh, John chapter 8, beginning at verse 40 down to verse 42. And it reads like this. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. It begins with the word but. But is a conjunction, and a conjunction that is an adversive. It's a contrast. It's a contrast to what we saw in verse 39. In verse 39, they say they're uh, Abraham's children. <laughs> and uh, the but is now Jesus' response, showing them they're not Abraham's children at all. Now, the real first word in the Greek is not but, but now, day in the Greek. And, and that word now means that it's happening at this very moment. And so what Jesus now does is shows that they are seeking. And that word seeking is in the present tense. They are seeking to do what? They are seeking to kill him. So that's what the great contrast is. They're saying they're Abraham's children. And Jesus is saying, I know your heart. I know you've been plotting and scheming now for over a year, going all the way back to John chapter 5, that you have been planning to kill me. And the word kill is in the aorist tense. That means to be specific in time and place, to accomplish your mission, to eliminate me. Three times that we find in this passage, Jesus has declared that they are trying to kill him. In John chapter 7, verse 19, and in verse 39, we saw it in the previous verse, and now here in this verse, three times. But it's also important to note, every time they have attempted, and Jesus has revealed that they have attempted to kill him, that it is associated with their rejection of the word. There is a definite correlation between murder and a hatred for the word of God. We'll see that in verse 44, where Jesus says that you're of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode, abided not in the truth. The issue was they did not abide in the truth. If they weren't in the truth, they were in a lie. And if they're in a lie, then they will be, therefore, hating the truth and killing anyone who holds the truth. So now Jesus says, now you seek to kill me. Now, notice what he says. This is really interesting because it's only said one time in the entire Bible, and that Jesus calls himself a man. Frequently, he calls himself the Son of Man. But here he is referring to a man. Why? Because they think of him only as a man. But now Jesus qualifies. Remember, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's what we find here. Here is a man, Jesus said, who has told you, and that's plural, the truth. I have declared the truth. And what happens when we declare the truth? Then there is a reaction. 
And that is what is causing them to then respond. Jesus is the truth. It's interesting when you read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, that God in sundry times, diverse manners, has spoken to the fathers by the prophets, and he continued to speak. But he has spoken, and that is in the eras tense with finality. He has spoken in this last time to us. God has said all that he needs to say. Jesus is the truth. And so now Jesus says, I have heard this from God. So you try to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I have received, I've heard from God, no other man has ever had and heard direct revelation from heaven, from God, except Jesus, because he is God. Okay, so now, he says, Abraham didn't do this. Abraham, when he was rebuked, and remember he was rebuked twice. Both in Genesis chapter 12, he's rebuked in verse 18, when he went to Egypt with Sarah, and while he is there, he lies and tells Pharaoh that Sarah is his sister. That was a half-truth because she was his half-sister. And in lying, Pharaoh discovers it in a dream that God revealed to him, and Pharaoh rebuked him. What did Abraham do? Abraham does not recoil, become defensive, counterattack. Instead, Abraham confesses. Interestingly, Pharaoh gives to Abraham blessing and sends him off. But Abraham doesn't do that once. Abraham commits the exact same sin a second time. And this now is in Genesis chapter 20, and it's found in verse 9 with Abimelech, a Philistine king, where Abraham again lies about Sarah, his wife. And what does Abimelech do? The same thing, rebukes him. How does Abraham respond? He doesn't try to kill Abimelech. That's what Jesus is saying. I've declared the truth. The truth exposes the lie. The lie will always then cause a reaction. The response is either going to be contrition, brokenness, and repentance, or it's going to cause us to try to do away with the messenger. That's what happened here. It was Solomon. Solomon who says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1, he who is often rebuked and hardens his neck, his neck will suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. So how do you respond when the truth, whether it is the Spirit of God from the Word of God speaking to you directly, and revealing sin in your life, how do you respond? Or when you hear someone teaching the Word of God, and it reveals something within you, and you know you're guilty, how do you respond? Now notice what is said in verse 41. You, and the word you, is emphatic again. You, Jesus is pointing right at them, you do the deeds. Now that word do is emphatic, and the idea is you are doing. You are presently doing. Now remember that word now that we saw in the beginning? They are actively plotting. They are doing it. Jesus knows their heart. You're doing the deeds of your father, and that word is emphatic. And now the word father is referring to, we'll find out later on, it's referring to Satan because he has two characteristics. He is a liar from the beginning. He hates the truth. And secondly, he is a murderer from the beginning because that's always the response to the truth when we don't like what it says. And we love darkness rather than light. So Jesus said, you do the deeds of your father and they then respond. And how did they respond? They said to him, 
We are not born of fornication. Why would they say that? Remember, this is in the context of the woman that is caught in the act of adultery. They have already admitted by dropping their stones that they also are guilty. And this isn't a crowd of people, and allegedly those who have some agreement of believing something about what Jesus is saying, but maybe the Jewish leaders and those now who have joined with them are themselves saying, we're not a fornication. Even though that was true, that's not true now. And fornication was characteristic of the Gentiles. Now, the word fornication in the Greek is pornea. It is the word we get our English word pornography from. It means the writing of harlots, if you have the word pornography. But the word poinia is the word for harlot. It is one who is literally just in the flesh and for the purposes of selling themselves or if for the purposes of physical pleasure, they are using what God has ordained to be sacred and using it in another way. Jesus is simply exposing their hearts. Defensively, they immediately identify the very thing they're guilty of. <laughs> now, this is really interesting. In Hosea, he compares Israel's idolatry to an individual who is, and now this is the phrase, a child of fornication. If you were to see that in the Greek, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew book of Hosea, you would find the exact same phrase. It's in the Greek. They're saying, we're not a fornication. No, we're not what Hosea declared us to be as idolaters. And that then explains why they then say, we have one, and that's emphatic, one father, and that is God. Now, of course, as soon as they say that, they're quoting the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord that your God is one God. They are trying to say our doctrine is right. And because our doctrine is right, and because we're of the seed of Abraham physically, then we're okay. But Jesus then then responds to them. And he says in verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me. Notice he said prior, if Abraham was your father, you'd do the deeds of Abraham. And now he says, if God is your father, because God is love, then you will also love. You will love your neighbor as yourself. You will love God with all your heart, soul, and might. And because Jesus is the truth, he is God, you would love him. Ah, but they don't. And the reason why they don't is because they love themselves. They're proud, they're arrogant, and they love darkness rather than light. James said it so well in James chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. He says, If you had bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom comes not from above, it's not from God. It's earthly, it's sensual, it's demonical. The wisdom that comes from above is first pure and peaceable, easy to be entreated. So ask yourself, how do you respond when rebuked from the Word of God? When the Holy Spirit is convicting you and telling you, this is where you're wrong. You're wrong in your attitude, wrong in your thinking, wrong in your beliefs, and wrong in your behavior, wrong in your speech. The truth does set us free. But when we lie to ourselves, we remain in bondage. Jesus then reminds them and declares to them where he is from. He says, For I have proceeded and have 
proceeded forth and have come from God. Proceed means I'm here. But I came with a mission. He makes three claims. He's descended. He is present with them. And he is submitted to the will of the Father. Why did he come? What was his mission? Oh, it wasn't to judge. It was to declare the truth. And you're now left to judge yourself. To repent. To be broken and contrite. And to admit. God's right. We're wrong. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to reveal the light. And so what is your response now? How do you respond to the working of the Holy Spirit when he rebukes you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are good and gentle in even how you speak to us about our sin. You call us to yourself. You want so much that we would yield to you, that we might know the truth, and the truth would set us free. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.